Good morning everyone, my name is Andy and I'm the Partner Manager for Bytes. Thank you for attending our webinar today. This will focus on cost saving in Azure. To assist Bytes in delivering success as Microsoft's number one cloud partner, we work with a number of especially selected partners in our ecosystem who provide specially focused and highly skilled expertise in focused areas around Microsoft Cloud. Power On Platforms are a lead Azure partner for Bytes, and Gennaro from Power On Platforms will take you through the webinar and host a Q&A at the end. You'll also be joined by uh, Fabian, uh, Bytes' own Microsoft licensing specialist. Uh, a quick bit of housekeeping, during the webinar you are muted but you can submit questions at any time via the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. There is a Q&A session at the end um, to answer any of those submitted questions. Uh, the webinar recording will be made available and also if you can please complete the critique form at the end uh, where you can request a call back from one of our specialists at Bytes. I'll now hand you over to Gennaro. Good morning, everyone. So Gennaro here from Power On Platforms. Uh, and just to take you through this webinar on uh, estimating and managing costs with Azure. So just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction uh, to Azure. So many of you know already of Azure. You've probably, uh, probably seen it, heard it, Googled it, uh, whichever. So just wanted to give a, a little bit of, of an introduction as to, as to what Azure is. So. I normally start this by saying Project Red Dog, and a lot of people look at me very confused when I say that, but Project Red Dog was Microsoft's original infrastructure-based platform. This was developed and rebranded to what we know as Azure following the public release. And since then, Azure has grown substantially over the years, including many different services that are both infrastructure-related as well as the platform and software services that some of you are aware of. Azure provides many different services. And these services are available uh, to the public, to the customers on a flexible billing model that is based on consumption. Azure is also based in 40 different regions with data centers based out of the US, Brazil, Asia, Japan, and, uh, and Australia. And of course, we also have the newest editions of the UK and Germany. So I mentioned that Azure was an infrastructure service. Um, well, Azure was an infrastructure service, but now these data centers are not just for hosting your infrastructure. They provide you many different services, even things like Office 365, Dynamics Online, and even Xbox Live are all based in the Azure data centers. So this gives you an idea of the scale that Microsoft have, um, have implemented in terms of this data center. There are also many third-party applications that run within Azure. So Azure has opened the doors to many different vendors and many different products uh, to, to, to host the applications. So as just to touch off, Microsoft are continually developing and investing in Azure. And this is not just the hardware element. Yeah, we, we've of course seen the, uh, the UK and Germany uh, data centers spring up and there's probably more on the roadmap to come. But Microsoft is also heavy, uh, investing heavily into the development of the services that run on Azure. Um, as well as investing into things like the compliance of the Azure data centers. So everyone at some point will or have asked the question as to why I would move to Azure. So let's touch on a couple of points real quick. Azure is scalable. It has rapid provisioning capabilities and an overall flexible uh, model. So you only build for what you utilize or what you consume. And this can align um, very nicely with various scenarios. So a few of these to know are things like the on and off model. Um, so we'll see this model with things like disaster recovery and business continuity. Test and dev is also a very good example of this. So for example, if I have a, a project coming up where I have to test my, um, my product or application, um, I'm not gonna need a server for a whole year or I'm not gonna need a server for, for the rest of my life or anything like that. It's just, I need a server for maybe one or two months to test this application on and then I can scrap and bin the server. Azure fits very nicely into this, being able to rapidly create a server, but then at the same time, turn it off and not be billed for it. We also have things like um, 
growing fast. So if your business is a, is a fast grower, uh, for example, you may have released a new application or a new set of products, this may require you to have a, a scalable model to keep up with the demand of that application service. So again, Azure fits in very nicely with anything that grows fast or grows rapidly. We also have things like unpredictable bursting. So this would be a, a sudden surge of resource usage. So for an example with the NHS, um, if, there's a, if there's a natural disaster, a flu or an outbreak, um, they may require additional resources for existing services. So it gives you that option to have uh, resources at your fingertips when you need them. We also have things like the predictable bursting. So pretty much the other side of this, if you can predict that you may need resource at certain times of the year, this would align very nicely with it. So example, a lot of retail businesses at Christmas would probably benefit from this. So how does the value of Azure align to the above scenarios? Azure can in some cases give you cost reduction and cost optimizations, as well as the intangible benefits of things like uh, less management, less administration, and also being self-service. So a big example of this that I generally use is backups. Uh, more and more we are seeing tape backups being decommissioned for easier management and reduced cost. Aside from the possibility of saving costs, another advantage of, our, uh, of Azure uh, allows IT to be more agile. It gives IT access to quick on-demand computing thanks to the rapid scaling and automation aspects of Azure. For example, one customer has gone from having just an on-premise Active Directory to having a multi-factor authentication with conditional access in days. So that's days, not weeks or months. They have taken a project that would generally take quite a long time and squeeze it into a couple of days. Because cloud and, uh, and Azure services are very agile and allow you to get up and running very quickly. More and more, we are seeing that these typical projects take um, it takes such a short time and it's generally the planning that takes longer than actually implementing the cloud services. Most of these is just a tick box exercise and there you have it, you've got a service. It's just planning around how you want that to fit into your business requirements. Finally, Azure can fit well into long-term strategies for more uh, innovative projects as well as strategic opportunities for things like mergers and acquisitions. Azure's scalability ensures that you have enough resource and compute to support these newer projects and opportunities. So I suppose if I was to summarize this, um, the cost reduction is not always a top priority. Of course, we always wanna see uh, you know, some cost savings uh, at, at, at any given moment, but you may have a requirement for quicker services or resources only when you need it. So, there are many methods to migrate, move, or even begin using Azure. And I just wanted to list out some of the methods in high level to help you understand how you would get into Azure and that there is not just one path to take. So looking at this list, a lot of you are probably familiar with the term lift and shift. Um, this process effectively picks up your server and drops it into the cloud. It is considered one of the more easier methods as there are plenty of tools and guides out there to support on things like this but generally the issue comes from wanting to move outdated systems such as Server 2003 into Azure, which isn't supported. In this case, we'd look at something on the next step, which would be uh, build new, migrate existing. Um, haven't really found an actual name for it, that's pretty much what I call it, but similar to lift and shift, uh, except this method involves building a new server and, underlying, uh, and the underlying operating system that's based in Azure, and then migrate your application and service to that machine. So Azure is managing the hardware in OS, but you just manage the, uh, the application and the data that sits onto it. This method can be more time consuming, but gives a more future-proof approach to your migration and step into Azure. We then have the third option. Uh, this one's coming more and more popular. So this is actually migrating your services uh, to PaaS or platform as a service. Um, this method is completely different to the other two. It involves moving services that would normally be located on a server or servers, uh, say on-premise, and using Azure platform services to run the service instead. So an example of this would be instead of running SQL on a, on a full-blown VM uh, on-premise or in Azure, you could use the SQL platform service. So this would still give you the same SQL experience, but it will, uh, it, it's without the management uh, of the hardware or operating system within Azure. 
And finally, building new services. So maybe you don't have anything you want to move, or maybe you want to completely refresh your system and start a new project. In this case, you would uh, build and configure the new services in Azure. So let's take a look at some of the issues we've generally seen when planning to move to Azure. The biggest issue that, uh, that I have seen, that we have seen, uh, comes, uh, comes from the cost, and more specifically, the cost predicting, quoting, and optimization. Quoting for Azure is tricky. Uh, I've done it many times, and I still struggle to this day to do it as you generally need to consider all the specs of the machine and things like networking bandwidth, which is not always easy to predict or capture, can also be quite a long-winded process. And you often find that one service is also dependent on another, and you may have forgot to top this up before you, uh, while you put it into the Azure calculator. Before you know it, your Azure costs are way off and inaccurate. To throw another spanner in the works, you also have the server sizing. So a lot of people think, okay, so I have a server with 16 cores, so I need a server with 16 cores in Azure. This isn't necessarily true. Have you asked the question of how powerful are those cores in comparison to Azure? Or am I actually utilizing all those cores? Because let's face it, what's the point of purchasing compute power if you're not gonna utilize it? It's just gonna end up with you having a, a bigger bill. On premises, we're used to over specking our machines to future proof them. And this is all fine. Uh, and, uh, and this prevents against any spikes in performance that we may need. However, in Azure, a few clicks can give you more power when needed or less power when not needed. The rapid scaling options allow you to do this and the billing then aligns to that. So if you're not using that machine as much and you've turned it down, the costs will go down and likewise the costs will go up when you need more resources. There are even services in Azure that can automatically scale your machines. So in order to get an accurate size in, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Utilization of things like your CPU, your RAM, your disk IO, all impacts your Azure environment and in turn your costs. So we need to size in the most effective way. Finally, with any kind of migration, identifying the application and service dependency is always an overlooked task. When we migrate, we want to know what relies on what so we know what to migrate and in what order. There's no point in migrating the SQL server for an application, but not the application server. It just doesn't make sense. The performance degradation would make Azure not worth it. So let's take a quick look into how we would look to estimate costs within Azure. So we've got the option that we all know, the Azure calculator. Um, so in my opinion, uh, very easy to use and gives you a quick transparent pricing on Azure. But it's only good for very high level estimates if you know the level of resource needed and have mapped this to the current service. But by this I mean, if you know what you need, so if you know you need a, a four core eight gigabyte server, then using the Azure calculator would be fine. How do you size up that spec in the first place? Unless you're doing an apples for apples comparison or a one-to-one -one comparison. Either that or you would look to map it uh, after you've trawled through all your performance logs and base the sizing on this. If you don't do that, the costing won't be accurate, but again, very long-winded process. So in short, the Azure calculator is good, gives you a nice transparent cost, but it doesn't take into account what you already have and has no intelligence to map this to the Azure VM templates that, uh, that Microsoft provide. So to address this issue, uh, PowerOn have created a tool that is currently free to the community that, can, uh, that you can utilize to get an understanding of how much your infrastructure will cost in Azure. The tooling um, works by giving a nice high level uh, an analysis um, and provides an estimate given on that uh, by taking uh, things like your performance logs, crunching these through and mapping them to the correct, uh, correct uh, VM template. Estimating Azure has always been a tricky task. Uh, and while there are Microsoft tools like the uh, Azure calculator, these are more what do you want rather than what do I need? It takes the time and effort off of yourselves to try and match up the different Azure resources of your existing estate and give you a nice cost analysis in a, in a, in a, in a nice looking uh, dashboard. So to talk about this further um, in terms of how our uh, cost estimator tool works. So it's, uh, sorry, I should have said, it's called PACE, Power on Azure Cost Estimator, of course. Um, so it's, um, the tool is built for estimating costs 
in Azure by using Azure services. The process of our tool works quite simply. An agent is installed on a target server or servers, um, and this agent begins pushing up some basic info about your machine, as well as pushing up things like the performance logs. These are stored in Microsoft Operational Insights, a service based on Azure that acts as a log aggregator, but has smarter analytical solutions built in. However, what Power One has done has used a custom solution in Operational Insights to process and crunch the data. And this is used to provide the mapping to the correct Azure resource. Running the tool over an extended period of time will allow for better accuracy as it allows the calculation of things like your average, minimum, and maximum resource performance. Finally, we use a Power BI dashboard to present the data back uh, to our customers. So this is a friendly, nice to view dashboard and allows basic manipulation of the data. This is predominantly what you would see and it will give you a cost uh, monthly, yearly. You can select servers, different discounts, different locations. It presents it all back and shows you how much Azure would cost. So on this next bit, I'm going to introduce one of our, uh, one of Bytes's uh, licensing specialists, Fabian. So I don't know if you want to give yourself a quick intro and then jump into your slides. Hi, I'm uh, Fabian. I'm the Microsoft Licensing Specialist in Bytes, uh, and I'm just going to talk, um, still in Azure, on how the um, how we can actually reduce the cost of the services in Azure. Um, the first um, thing that we can use to reduce the cost in Azure is to use our own licenses. So. To save costs on Azure, you can bring your own licenses in Azure um, using the license mobility for SA benefits. Uh, that's available for all server application licenses. So you're just taking your own licenses with software assurance and installing them on the server um, on the Azure VMs. This um, is available as long as you have um, the software license and the CALs with SA, or if you have call licenses, um, the, ca the call licenses again with SA. And you license that in the same way you would on premises. So, for example, with a call licensing model, um, you would purchase the number of calls that are on the Azure VM, and again, there's a minimum of four call per VM, the same way there's on premises. Um, and then also with SQL Server, the same way you can do on premises, you can have the active passive benefits. So if you use your own licenses in Azure, um, you can license the active VM and then the passive VM would need to be licensed. So you would only pay for the compute and potentially the, um, the Windows Server image. Overall, it's usually cheaper to purchase volume licenses in that way than it is um, to uh, pay for the images in Azure per hour. You can also use MSDN subscriptions in Azure. So if you have Dev and Test boxes and you need to, for example, install SQL Server for Dev and Test purposes and you have active MSDN subscriptions, you can actually use that software um, in Azure. Um, and again, you would only pay for the compute and in the Windows Server image, and then the um, rest of the software is paid through your MSDN subscription. And then one new actually for this month is um, Windows 10 in Azure. So uh, since the beginning of August, you can now use Windows 10 as a VDA image in, in Azure using the current branch for business of Windows 10, as long as you have Windows per user or VDA per user, you can now use that in Azure. This is available from this month for any volume licensing agreement, and then next month will also be available for the Microsoft Cloud Agreement. And another way to look at reducing cost is to look at the compute pre-purchase offer. Um, so the way that works is we're really looking at VMs that you've got that are running 24-7. They have to be the same type. So we're looking at something that stays an A2 or a D2V2 in the same region and with the same operating system. And instead of paying for these VMs per hour, you prepay for the specific VM per year and then save up to 60%. Um, on those VMs. That doesn't allow you to scale up and down, so we're really looking at static VMs here, and instead of paying for them per hour, pay for them um, per year. 
Um, and we also have the hybrid use benefits. And so that allows you to use your own Windows Server licenses um, in Azure instead of paying for the images an hour. So the way it normally works when you pay for an Azure and VM is you'll pay for the compute and the Windows Server image. Now usually the um, Windows Server image costs about half what the total cost is. So if you're looking at an image that costs here D2V2 of an example with Windows Server, it's about 2,176 and with that Windows Server is 1,171. So you're making up to 40% um, in annual savings. To be able to use that benefit, you need to have Windows Server on, uh, sorry, Software Assurance on Windows Server, and each 16 core license allows you to run up to two VMs with, a, with up to eight cores each, or one VM with 16 cores. And then depending on the edition you have, if you've got data center edition, you can actually use both your on-premises software. So you can use your Windows Server on-premises as you do, and also get your two VMs in Azure. Um, and with standard, you have to use them either in Azure or on-premises. Uh, but either way, it will be cheaper to buy Windows Server um, images on using volume licensing than it is paying per hour. And then another offer we have is the Enterprise Dev and Test Offer. So if you have an enterprise agreement and MS, active MSCN subscriptions, um, you can reduce the cost on non-production environments. Um, so that offer will allow you to get reduced rates on Dev and Test Azure in uh, VMs. And I'll let Gennaro explain to you how that actually looks like in Azure. Yeah, so just to give a little bit of an overview of it really, when you purchase Azure underneath an agreement such as an EA, it stores this money or committed uh, committed money into a pot or a pool. Um, you can then create subscriptions underneath this and draw down on the, on the committed amount. So we'll generally have lots of different subscriptions for different departments or projects. So for example, um, we, PowerOn, uh, currently have, I think, about five subscriptions, and this is for our infrastructure, our infrastructure test. So these are your land-based infrastructure systems. Uh, you've got our product testing and development, our product hosting, and of course our web service. All of these are on different subscriptions, yet they consume from the same kind of uh, agreement. Um, so what this example allows you to kind of visualize is instead of having a dev subscription over here, a test subscription over there, have them all under the same umbrella to give you more centralized management of these subscriptions. After all, a lot of cost savings that you will immediately see is when you can manage everything from that kind of single window, that single portal, rather than having to go to five different portals to find the cost of one department. I want to kind of flip that around and say, I want to go to one portal and manage the cost of all five departments. It's having that centralized management and that standardized EA rate that will give you more, um, more clarity and more management over your cloud estate. Um, and so we've seen a few of um, ways to reduce the cost in Azure. So we're looking at licensing benefits and offers available. Um, and then looking at all of this, we can actually help you run a commercial assessment for Azure. So we've looked at um, the compute pre-purchase promo to reduce um, the cost of VMs that are static that run 24 hours. We've looked at the test and dev VMs, um, which we know we can reduce cost on the actual um, non-production VMs, and then finally look at the hybrid use and um, license mobility offers to see where we can reduce the cost on the actual software, whether that's using MSDN software, using Windows Server, or using server application like SQL or SharePoint or Exchange. And so overall, overall what, we'll do, what we do is um, look at the cost saving um, available through all these offers using your own environment and potential savings in Azure. Thanks Fabian. So I suppose um, to summarize this session today then, we effectively want to provide an Azure commercial assessment to support and assist you with understanding the costs of moving to the cloud, um, as well as how much those cloud services will in fact cost. At the same time, we want to start layering in the licensing offers that are out there to provide a more accurate and realistic cost of Azure. Now, 
this isn't just aimed at or do, this doesn't just apply to businesses that don't have Azure. Um, if you already have Azure and use Azure, then it would be more focused around what you are looking to do to optimize your cloud investment. Are you leveraging things like the hybrid use benefit or the compute pre-purchase? Or are your machines correctly sized? Can they be turned down, scaled up, scaled down, uh, uh, scaled down and scaled out? Um, it's, it's investigating these kind of questions that are very important for cloud management. As half the battle, half the battle with Azure and cloud is getting your services into the cloud. Um, the other half is making sure that they are optimized, so you're not throwing your money, uh, so you're not throwing your money away. So all of this will eventually feed into cost savings, but it's understanding uh, the commercials and the commercial management of Azure that will feed into this. So as for some follow-ups. Um, of course, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're more than happy to sign you up to the PACE tool, which will allow the, uh, the Azure cost estimations. We do offer this out as a free community tool at the minute. And this will kind of get you started to understand how much your systems would look to cost if moving them to Azure. Um, and of course, manage those costs more effectively. Further from that, please also engage us for any kind of support that you may require. Um, it may be something like a, an informal chat over a coffee around Azure and commercial management, or even a more formalized session such as our uh, cloud business review to talk more around the commercial management of Azure and how Azure can line to your business goals. In any case, we're here to support you. I suppose it's that, uh, it's that time of the day for questions. So if, uh, if anyone has any questions, please, uh, please do pop them into the um, questions window, I believe it is. And I will look to answer them. So someone has asked, uh, how do I get my hands on the PACE tool? So um, I believe at the bottom of the slide, there is uh, an email address, uh, tell me more at bytes.co.uk. So if you if you can reach out uh, to that email address, uh, they'll uh, of course put you in touch with the relevant people and we can look to get your PACE account set up. Uh, also got another question come through. You mentioned an agent for the PACE tool. Is this a... Um, so the, the PACE tool is based on, on Microsoft technology. So it uses operational insights and it uses the, the Microsoft agent very similar to the System Center Operations Manager agent. Um, so it is a Microsoft agent with some power on platforms configuration to it. This would generally just be the GUID that points to our operational insights tendency, if, uh, if that makes sense. Awesome. So um, thank you very much for your time today uh, and, and, and for the questions. Of course, if there are any further questions that you think of after this, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, otherwise, have a, have a great day. Thank you very much.